welcome to this, our next episode in our A to Z of Tudor Places series. I'm Sarah and I'm the Tudor Travel Guide. And in today's episode, we're going to bring to life a house which in its day was acknowledged as being one of the most magnificent houses in England. Yes, my friends, today we are exploring Otford Palace in Kent. Now, although only a fragment of the original building survives, Otford Palace is simply dripping with Tudor history. Many of the most recognisable names of the period have walked its corridors and strolled among its pleasant gardens. But before we come to talk about the palace's Tudor history in more detail, let us first, as usual, talk a little bit about the palace's origins. The site of Otford Palace has long been a place of noble settlement. Occupied originally by the Saxons, it was a royal estate which was then given as a gift from the monarchy to the church during the early medieval period. And over the course of successive incumbents, the palace would be aggrandized and ultimately it became the most splendid residence associated with the Archbishopric of Canterbury. Now, Otford Palace was originally a moated manor house and it was part of a circuit of residences frequently visited by the Archbishop of Canterbury and their households. Now, Otford was closer to London than the Archbishop's Palace at Canterbury, his principal residence outside of London. And this made Otford more convenient for travelling to attend the court and other business in London. During the period when it was in the possession of the church, it was also, of course, occasionally visited by the reigning monarch, who would reside there as the Archbishop's guest. That was until 1537, when Henry VIII's covetous eyes alighted upon the palace. In short order, in typical Henry style, he managed to wrest its ownership from the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer. Well, Cranmer certainly gave up the palace, but reluctantly. And from this point forward, Otford Palace belonged once again to the Crown. Now, perhaps we should talk a little bit about the appearance of the Tudor Palace at its zenith. Well, the person responsible for this mostly was William Warham, who was Archbishop of Canterbury between 1503 and 1532 when he died. And he was responsible for converting the early manor house into a sprawling complex, which in its heyday was larger than that of his rival, Thomas Wolsey's house, of course, Hampton Court Palace. But both were aggrandised around the same time, so circa 1514 to 1515. At this point, William Warren was both Archbishop of Canterbury and Henry VIII's Lord Chancellor, so a very important man. He later wrote that the palace that he began to expand was ruinous by neglect, but he had now sufficiently repaired and enlarged and built a great house that had galleries and towers and various new gardens. He was obviously very pleased with his work. The palace was approached from the tiny village of Otford, much as it is today, along a track which led to an enormous outer gatehouse. Sadly, only a small portion of this gatehouse survives, the ground floor of the western part of the gatehouse tower still stands. It was used as a barn for a period of time and more recently served the local community as a communal space. Now if you walk along the current track that runs to the left of a row of cottages, you will be walking under what was once the passageway beneath the gatehouse arch. Partway along, you will notice on your right a bricked up doorway and this once led to the guard chamber. Of course it would have been here that your suitability to enter the palace, your credentials if you like, or the nature of your business would have been checked by the guards on duty. 
Now, as I've intimated, unfortunately for us, the gatehouse collapsed in the early 18th century, leaving only the fragment which survives today. However, to reimagine it as it might have looked, we can turn to images of how Wolsey's principal gatehouse at Hampton Court appeared in its heyday, and there would have been a comparison between the two. Now, beyond the gatehouse was a large inner courtyard. It wasn't square, but trapezoid in shape. And in fact, if you visit today, you can still see the raised plateau of ground, which originally made up part of the inner courtyard. Although today, actually, the most easterly part of the original courtyard lies beyond a hedge in private property, so you can't get a sense of its full scale. Nevertheless, running around the edge of this courtyard were four ranges with ground floor cloisters. The remains of one of these ranges can be seen in the surviving cottages. Now, this range of buildings once formed part of the north range of the palace. And in fact, if you look at the brickwork, you can easily see the 11 arches, which have now been bricked up, but would have originally been open, giving access to a covered walkway, which ran around the sides of the courtyard. But above this arcade, on the north side, at first floor level, was a gallery. Today, that has been long since lost. So what we have at Otford, or what we had adjoining the main gatehouse on either side, were two storied galleries running one to the east and one to the west. And they led in turn to two octagonal corner towers. Now these marked the northeast and the northwest corners of this immense out of court. Now, happily for us, the Northwest Tower still stands and it is indeed the most striking feature of any visit to the remains of the palace today. And it has recently undergone significant restoration work to save it from decay and collapse, thanks in no small part to an enthusiastic band of local history lovers. Anyway, flanking each of these towers and running in a southerly direction, were in fact two more galleries. One was on the west side of the palace and one on the east. The eastern gallery overlooked the kitchen garden, beyond which stood the domestic offices of the palace. On the opposite side of the outer courtyard in the west range, there was another gallery, this time this gallery had 21 adjoining chambers at ground floor level and they were used to house the Archbishop's extensive household. And on the first floor, directly above these chambers, was the Privy Gallery for used by the Archbishop or, of course, by visiting royalty. Now, undoubtedly, this west range of lodgings had the most splendid views as it overlooked the palace's formal gardens in which we know that kings and queens, archbishops and great men and ladies of the past enjoyed each other's company. But what was directly across from the main outer gatehouse in, if you like, a southerly direction? Well, as you might expect, there was another gatehouse, the inner gatehouse, and this gave entry to the smaller second court, and the principal buildings of the palace that occupied the moated site of the pre-Tudor manor house. Beyond this inner gatehouse was a complex of rather higgledy-piggledy buildings and little courtyards, which included the medieval Great Hall, the chapel and the state apartments used by the Archbishop, the King and the Queen, although the exact layout of these buildings is not entirely clear. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the principal visitors, and particularly royal visitors, who spent time at Otford. Well, as we know, Warham's Episcopal Mansion played host to royalty on a number of occasions. Henry VIII visited in August 1519, and again between the 21st and 22nd of May 1520. Alongside him at that time was his first wife, 
Catherine of Aragon as the royal couple and their vast entourage of around 4,000 people <laughs> were on their way to France to meet Francis I, a gathering of course that later became known for its magnificence as the Field of Cloth of Gold. Now, clearly impressed by Warham's newly built palace, Henry returned in May 1522 and again in September 1527. In 1532, five years later, after Warham's death, the 11-year-old Princess Mary would go on to spend a couple of summers at Otford. Now, in addition to those royal visitors, Erasmus and Holbein were also regular guests at the palace. And perhaps it's worth noting that Thomas Cranmer penned at least some of his historic common book of prayer while staying at Otford. Now, as we have already mentioned, Henry liked Otford so much that he finally took possession of it very shortly after the death of Jane Seymour in 1537. Perhaps the last great event we might associate with Otford during Henry VIII's reign was the fact that it was at the palace in early October 1544 that Catherine Parr was reunited with the king after his triumphant return from a military campaign in France, a campaign, of course, which had seen the capture of Boulogne. It would be the last of Henry's military triumphs. Now, of course, the king was very clearly fond of Otford. And between 1541 and 1546, just a year or so before the king's death, Henry VIII spent large amounts of money on repairing the buildings and maintaining the fish ponds, parks and the gardens there. But despite this, within two years of Henry's death in January 1547, the crown seems to have lost interest in the site. And it was in short order that the mighty Otford Palace started to fall into decay. And even as close as 1570, its ruin was already being noted. In a book called A Perambulation of Kent, written in that very year, its author notes, whereof the old hall and chapel only do one remain. Well, my friends, what if you wanted to visit the site of Otford Palace today? Well, I've, of course, mentioned that the remains of Warren's once great, magnificent palace are located in the charming little Kentish village of Otford. This little patch of low-lying land, surrounded by a crescent-shaped ridge of upland, manages to retain its quiet splendour. Now, the main car park that you might want to use is situated just off the high street, just a few minutes walk from the palace. And so it makes for a very convenient place to stop off, explore the village and the historic ruins. You will find at the centre of Otford a very, very large and rather magnificent duck pond, which is the only listed duck pond, I believe, in England. And around it, cluster shops and a tea room and the parish church and you will notice that the driveway leads down towards the remains of the palace. Now this driveway is not in precise alignment of the original track that would have led you down to the outer gatehouse. That lies a little to your left and ran originally just in front of the entrance to the church. But walk down Palace Approach and you can see the remains of the North Range in a series of cottages which are still lived in today. And if you make your way around to the left, you will be able to follow that track that leads you underneath where the original outer gatehouse once stood. Now, before we finish, just a couple of more things to say. So although people still live in the cottages, you are allowed to wander around, look at the track that once ran beneath the gatehouse, look at the northwest tower and even go and stand on that flat plateau of ground which was once part of the outer courtyard. Now, after your visit, if you want to go and see a 3D representation of the palace at its zenith, you need to make your way back to the duck pond and take the second turning on the left into the high street 
A little way along here, opposite the entrance to the main car park, is the Otford Heritage Centre. And this has a model of the palace on display, but do make sure you check opening times before you visit as it is not always open. But I will say that if you're on the other side of the world or just simply cannot visit in person, there is a wealth of information about Otford Palace and a really lovely little series of videos which tells the story of Otford Palace online. And I'll put a link to that in the description associated with this video. Now, as with visiting any English village, you must check out the local parish church, in this case, St. Bartholomew's. You'll find it close to the duck pond and near to the track that leads you down to the old remains of the palace itself. You can't miss it. But when you go inside, you'll find an ornate 16th century Easter sepulchre. Now note the Tudor roses and on one of the spandrels, a pomegranate, the badge of Catherine of Aragon. Now, my friends, what day out in the English countryside seeing a historic ruin would be complete without taking tea and cake? And you will be pleased, one of my favourite things, by the way, and you will be pleased to hear that although this is a small village, Otford is reasonably well furnished with tea room and pubs that provide rest and refreshment for the weary traveller. Finally, remember, if you are in the area, Knoll House, which also once was part of the property portfolio of the Archbishops of Canterbury and was later taken by Henry VIII, is not too far away. And so it is worth thinking about combining a visit to the two of them at the same time. Well, with that, I think we've come to the end of our potted history of Otford Palace. I hope you've enjoyed this A to Z of Tudor Places. And of course, I look forward to returning next month when we will be tackling the letter P. But until then, my friends, as ever, all that remains for me to say is happy time travelling. Mm -hmm.